Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Sister Jacinta as we continue our spiritual journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh my God, I firmly believe that you are one God in three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that your divine Son became man, died for our sins, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches because you have revealed them who can neither deceive nor be deceived. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today we're starting with a section that has a heading incorporated into the church, the body of Christ. And um, last week, as we were speaking, we were talking about the um, sacrament of baptism. So looking at what this incorporation would mean. Baptism makes us members of the body of Christ. Therefore, we are members one of another. Baptism incorporates us into the church. From the baptismal fonts is born the one people of God of the new covenant, which transcends all the natural or human limits of nations, cultures, races, and sexes. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Okay, and this is beautiful. Okay, this is the whole thing about mystical body of Christ. And um, we become part of that one body and, and then everything else disappears. I mean, you know, so my arm isn't going to be saying, no, I'm French and I mean, no, and I'm German. Okay, um, we're all one, we're one body of Christ. Okay, so it's that oneness. All right, the baptized have become living stones to be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. By baptism, they share in the priesthood of Christ in his prophetic and royal mission. They are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that they may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. Baptism gives a share in the common priesthood of all believers. Okay, so it's a beautiful, okay, um, analogy that of being stones, of living stones, okay, building up into a church, Sometimes we think about a link um, of change. You know, and we say a chain is as strong as its weakest link, okay? If you've got a weak link, okay, the whole chain is affected. So we're not in competition with each other. And, and this is where division is so hurtful, okay? Because it weakens the church, okay? Just like we have those stones, okay? Living stones, okay? Built on top of each other, okay? Um, you know, and there's, there's just grunting going on. You've got a shaky building. All right. Um, so our, our Lord is really, you know, um, showing how interdependent we are. OK, um, again, him being the head, us being that body. OK, that one body, that division is very, very divisive. Having become a member of the church, the person baptized belongs no longer to himself, but to him who died and rose for us. From now on, he is called to be subject to others, to serve them in the communion of the church and to obey and submit to the church's leaders, holding them in respect and affection. Just as baptism is a source of responsibilities and duties, the baptized person also enjoys rights within the church to receive the sacraments, to be nourished with the word of God and to be sustained by other spiritual helps of the church. So let's look at that in two, two sections there, okay? Having become a member of the church, the person baptized belongs no longer to himself, but to him who died and rose for us. And from now on, he's called to be subject to others, to serve in the communion of the church and to obey and submit to the church's leaders. Okay, this is, okay, really important to know. All right, um, you know, this, again, um, it is like being a part of a, of a team, you know, once you've committed to being a part of that team and, you know, they're counting on you because you're really good at outfielding or you're really good at being the pitcher. Okay. And then just to be able to, you know, ho hum, you know, I, I could just go ahead and take myself off the team. Okay. It, it's very, it would be very hurtful. Okay. So in that same sense, okay, in a much greater sense, okay. In that mystical body of Christ, once we've made that commitment, okay. Our, um, our holiness matters. Okay, so us submitting or not submitting can truly take down the church or can build it up. And we look at what a good leadership does. 
okay? Whether that be the witness of just a member who's even the youngest, okay? Or those who were put into authority. And we realize where you can just fly, okay? Under that good influence, okay? Being given inspiration. Think about Agnes, okay? She's only 12 years old, maybe at the most 14, okay? But I think she was around 12. And um, her witness, okay, to her Christianity brought hundreds to the faith. Okay, because she was just like, what's life about? I mean, it's about eternity. It's about God. And, and so she was willing to put her life on the line and literally, okay, sacrifice her life. And, but it gave others courage to, to recognize, okay, that, you know, what are they living for? Why are they under the fear of losing a job, okay, or their life, okay? And, and so they were willing to stand up and say they were Christian. So again, that, and that could be considered one of the weakest, okay, okay, in members of the church, okay, you're very young, okay, um, child, okay, and then you have great leaders, and you think about what happened under great leadership, and we've seen this, okay, in the church, okay, whether that would be the popes themselves or bishops, okay, and they can get an entire, um, you know, uh, people entrusted to their care, full of zeal and energy and and um, holding on to the truths with, with greater love and passion, okay, uh, with prayerfulness. So this is, again, really, really important, okay, recognizing that commitment that goes on there. All right, now, after that part, it says, and then also holding them who are in authority in respect and affection. And I think that that's really important because there are times, okay, like within our own family, let's just go with that authority, when we may not agree, okay, with our parents. Maybe they're even wrong, okay? Now, does that give us a right, okay, to be disrespectful? No, okay? We don't have to obey, okay? We may have to even tell our siblings, you know what, that actually is not something we want to be able to imitate, okay? Uh, maybe we need to guard them, okay? Maybe, they're, you know, it's something that's serious, but never, okay, disrespect is something we have to work on, okay? That, that, that's huge. So within the church, there are times when our leadership may be weak or even, um, what do we call it, um, evil, okay? And, um, you know, God's worked through all of that. He continues to work through that, okay? The church is not dependent on men. It's dependent on God, okay? And that's why he says, even the gates of hell will not prevail. Um, you know, how amazing is it that he allows the sacrament still to be effective, even if a priest, a bishop, a pope, if we're in mortal sin, okay? Uh, that's like the most beautiful gift that he could give us, that he would not withhold the means of holiness to us. So, um, again, making sure that we always keep that respect, okay, and, and try to have the affection that, of a child, okay, towards those in authority. Um, so, giving them the, the prayers, okay, that they are due. And sometimes, I always think, I think about this lady who, um, and I didn't meet her, I just remember hearing the story. Um, uh, and I, I guess that some guy knew the doctor, okay? He, so he talked about the fact that there was a, a group of doctors who had a woman come whose child was sick. And um, when she got to the hospital, her faith in doctors was phenomenal. And the doctors were going to dismiss the case, but they were so taken back by the trust. I mean, this lady just felt like everything was safe because now her child was in the hand of doctors. These doctors actually, as a result, put their brains and heads together and, and all their knowledge and skills. And they were actually able to save this child who normally they would have not. Okay. Which was amazing. Okay. Um, and this woman had no idea. Okay, maybe she found out later. Okay, but I know a friend of the doctor was the one who said, like, we couldn't disappoint. You know, and so you think about that. Sometimes that um, that beauty of trust in leadership, okay, in our church, many times it can help inspire our priest to greater holiness, or bishops, or even the pope. Okay, so um, again trying uh, to nurture that respect and that affection for those in authority. Now, just as baptism is a source of responsibility and duties, okay, that comes with it, but the baptized person also enjoys rights, rights within the church to receive the sacraments, to be nourished with the word of God, 
to be sustained by other spiritual helps of the church. Okay, so, um, you know, again, this is something that sometimes we have to awaken um, those who are entrusted with those sacraments uh, to the fact of what we have rights to, okay? That right, okay, to go to Holy Mass, that right to receive our Lord, that right to have confession. Um, you know, uh, it comes with baptism. So again, always with respect, always with affection, um, as much, okay, as our hearts are able to um, work with all of that so that we build up the church, okay? We build each other up, okay? Authority is helped by subjects. Subjects are helped by authority. So we continue. Reborn as sons of God, the baptized must profess before men the faith they have received from God through the church and participate in the apostolic and missionary activity of the people of God. Okay, again, professing before men the faith they have received from God. All right, that's a huge responsibility. And there's many a times when you are tempted, you know, to um, weaken in that, okay, because it's not popular, okay, to be um, Christian, let alone Catholic, okay? And, um, you know, so it can become sort of awkward at times, okay? You could become the butt of the jokes. And, um, but, you know, what distinguishes you from the, your fellow workers? You should be distinguishable, okay? Your language, okay? Your decisions, your integrity, your kindness and thoughtfulness, okay? Your honesty. These are something that really should make you stand out and that our end is not... Um, for riches, okay, or possession, or power, okay, um, you know, these are just the means to survival, okay, but the, um, the, the building up of another person, okay, approaching them as human beings, okay, and not as objects, not, you know, this, this is something, again, that really should be um, a witness, okay, by the way, in which we, um, our tone, our look, our actions, um, the things that we refrain from, the things that we do. Alrighty. So there was a lot there, okay, with that baptism and being a member of the church. Then we talk about the sacramental bond of unity of Christians. I'm on 1271. Baptism constitutes the foundation of communion among all Christians, including those who are not yet in full communion with the Catholic Church. For men who believe in Christ and have been properly baptized are put in some, though imperfect, communion with the Catholic Church. Justified by faith in baptism, they are incorporated into Christ. They therefore have a right to be called Christians and with good reason are accepted as brothers by the children of the Catholic Church. Baptism therefore constitutes the sacramental bond of unity existing among all who through it are we born? And, you know, again, using that uh, term of brotherhood is so beautiful, okay? It is something that was um, really um, given attention, okay, during Vatican Council II, because up to this point, we have called them schismatics or heretics. And it's not that that's incorrect, okay, because schism is, okay, a break with obedience, okay, subjecting myself to authority, okay, heresy is holding on to a doctrine that is contrary, okay, to what Christ bequeathed to us, okay, and trusted to us, but there are many, okay, in today's world who have not done that actively, okay, <laughs> you know, this is something that the church has looked at, okay, we are now looking at close to 500 years now of this break, okay, so, Many, um, you know, times when you're, you're working with people who are not from a Catholic background, they don't understand, you know, like where you could say that your church has the fullness of truth because within the Protestant sects, okay, you can very easily just go from being Methodist to being Baptist to being Lutheran, okay, to being, um, you know, there's some changes, but they don't, they just look at, you know, whatever one is, the most um, true to your understanding, okay? And and we don't hold it that way, okay? We do believe that, you know, whether I like it or don't like it, <laughs> this is what Christ taught, and this is what the apostles passed on, and this is what I am committing myself to. Um, but 
um, to use those words, sometimes it causes a greater division. You know, to be able to see each other as brother and sister, all striving for God, okay? They've not actively um, renounced, okay, uh, the truths. They don't know those truths that they've been separated from. Um, you know, they don't understand that authority. So it is something that we've um, used more the word separated brethren to bring about a greater understanding of how much we are united and to work on that, okay, um, to be able to build those bridges, to be able to bring us back again to that fullness of the truth and hopefully to become, again, one holy Catholic church. Uh, so with that, we go to this section called the an indelible, indelible uh, spiritual mark. Incorporated into Christ by baptism, the person baptized is configured to Christ. Baptismal seals the Christian with the indelible mark or character of his belonging to Christ. No sin can erase this mark, even if sin prevents baptism from bearing the fruits of salvation. Given once for all, baptism cannot be repeated. And again, the only way, I mean, not the only way, there's lots of ways, okay, but the way that helps me, okay, is taking that bowl of clay, all right, and once we have been baptized, we are no longer a bowl, okay, we may be a bowl, okay, <laughs> with the O W, okay, instead of the A L L, okay, um, you know, and we now can hold water, okay, um, and maybe it's a vase, maybe it's a, you know, um, I don't know, whatever kind of vessel you want to call it, okay, um, but the fact of the matter is, it can contain, all right, it can contain the life of Christ within, whether we cooperate with that or not, we don't change who we are. Okay, so if I would choose not to work with grace, if I would choose to break this vessel, whether once or into a thousand pieces, okay, that form is there, okay, with all its brokenness, okay, or one break, whatever the case might be, whether I am in, you know, well, you know, if I'm in hell, I mean, that dignity, that whole character change is there. And also a greater grief, okay, and, and sorrow, or a greater joy, okay. Um, so, you know, we're hoping, okay, that we all fulfill what we are, we are, okay, we're a new creation, okay, and that new creation was meant to have that fullness of life within, okay, like our Lord said, um, that, you know, if you, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you would ask him, and you would no longer have to keep on going, you know, to seek water, because you would have water coming up within you, okay, and bubbling over, okay, like that fountain of life, okay, that Holy Spirit living within us, okay, um, the superabundance of life. So this is what we're talking about with this indelible mark. It cannot be erased. You cannot be baptized again, okay. Um, even, you know, you could be restored, okay, if you've been broken, okay, and, um, you know, again, it's not stagnant because this has a lot of you know, it doesn't really fall, you know, it's a great analogy because, you know, with every opportunity, there's an expansion, okay, of, of the amount of um, relationship and, and, and life of, of the Holy Spirit within us, okay, so we're not stagnant, okay, you know, um, you know, you might be the size of a thimble, but as your love and knowledge of God grows, you can grow, okay, from a thimble into a cup, from a cup to a bucket, to a bucket, to, I don't know, okay, a barrel, I guess, okay, but you know what I mean? So there's always this continual growth, okay, in our relationship and in our love and in our ability to um, have the life of God within us expanding. And he is infinite, so there's no, um, there's no limit. Okay, so we continue. Incorporated into the church by baptism, the faithful have received the sacramental character that consecrates them from Christian religious worship. The baptismal seal enables and commits Christians to serve God by a vital participation in the holy liturgy of the church and to exercise their baptismal priesthood by the witness of holy lives and practical charity. All right, so again, if you're that vessel, okay, that holds water, okay, all right, um, then it needs to be obvious, okay, it needs to be bringing forth life, okay, it needs to be, um, you know, working and contributing to the church, participating as it can, okay, in the liturgies. Uh, the Holy Spirit has marked us with the seal of the Lord, and in Latin, that's Dominicus character, for the day of redemption. Baptism, indeed, is the seal of eternal life. The faithful Christian who has 
kept the seal until the end, remaining faithful to the demands of his baptism, will be able to depart this life with the sign of faith, with his baptismal faith in expectation of the blessed vision of God, the consummation of faith, and the hope of resurrection. Okay, like a rallying point. Okay, it's where we're going to. Okay, it's what we're we're made for. Okay, and so we again remain always um, in a in a position of supplication to God. Okay, I, I you know when the apostles were at the table and our Lord said, "One of you will betray me," I think it's so interesting that they didn't say, "I won't betray you," "I won't betray you," "I won't betray," you, but they said, "Lord, is is it I?" Lord, they said, "I." Okay. In other words, they they are aware of their weakness, you know, um, and so we're always, you know, begging God to help us to remain faithful to that baptismal seal that was given to us, and that seal more than anything. Okay, like I said, that that idea of the clay. Okay, it it, it, it has its it has its points. Okay, but it has also a lot of uh, um, you know things that don't work, and you know because it's a relationship. Okay, we're a child of God. Okay. And we remain a child of God. And so living as a child of God with all the rights of being able to call him our father, okay? Um, and, and sharing in that sonship of the, of, the Holy, of, of, the, of the son of God. And then that life of the Holy Spirit within us, okay? It is beautiful. It's phenomenal, okay? And um, it is, okay, and we get to see it in its fullness, okay? Uh, when we get to eternity, okay? So now we have to, um, bear with it, you know, in a little bit of, you know, uh, darkness in a sense, okay, because we can't see it in its fullness, okay, but we trust, okay, that's what faith is, okay, um, and that's what hope is, okay, so faith is like what I believe, okay, and acting on it, believing that it is specifically for my salvation is that hope, okay, so we're putting that faith into action, okay, and why, because I trust that God is love, okay, and then I let that love be reciprocated okay that he's pouring into me back to him and back to his mystical body okay the whole church whether they are potential members whether they are separated members or whether they are full members all right in brief 1275 christian initiation is accomplished by three sacraments together baptism which is the beginning of new life confirmation which is its strengthening and the Eucharist, which nourishes the disciple with Christ's body and blood for his transformation. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And again, taking that as a commission even for ourselves to go, okay, and make all nations, okay, disciples, um, you know, by teaching them to observe what I've commanded. May it be possible for them, you know, through observing you to know, okay, who Christ is, okay? Or at least become interested to know who Christ is. Baptism is a birth into the new life in Christ in accordance with the Lord's will. It is necessary for salvation as is the church's, church herself, which we enter by baptism. All right, so again, that baptism we know to be paramount. Our, our Lord said, you know, unless you be baptized, okay, you cannot have eternal life. Again, he is not bound by that law. We are bound by that law. And so we've talked about the fact that what happens to those who are not baptized, okay, and we realize there is a baptism of blood, there is a baptism of desire, okay? And, um, you know, what happens to babies, okay, that have not been baptized, we don't know. But we know that God could not give them eternal punishment, all right? And so, you know, whether they're in a place of natural bliss, okay, um, again, it doesn't seem that they could even be possible because we are made for something that's eternal. So I can't see how we'd ever be really happy just in natural happiness. But again, we don't know how that all works, okay? So we leave that part, you know what I mean, to the mercy of God. The essential rite of baptism consists in immersing the candidate in water or pouring water on his head while pronouncing the invocation of the most holy trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, this has been given to all of us in the case of an emergency. You may baptize the person, okay, 
um, again, by pouring water over their head, okay, as you were immersing them, okay, but in, using the words, I baptize you, okay, Mary, John, whoever, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of baptism or baptismal grace is a rich reality that includes forgiveness of original sin and all personal sins, birth into the new life by which a man becomes an adoptive son of the Father, a member of the church, a temple of the Holy Spirit. By this very fact, the person baptized is incorporated into the church, the body of Christ, and made a share in the priesthood of Christ. So we are all off, all obliged, okay, to be priests, okay? In other words, we are bringing gifts, okay, to offer to the Father, all right? That gift, especially of ourselves, okay? And, um, you know, that includes, okay, different sacrifices, okay? Like, you know, um, maybe you know, just little self-denials, okay, of time and convenience, um, comfort, uh, you know, mortifications. <clears throat> so, um, and then just bringing the entire church of God, okay, before God, you know, when we go to prayer, not just being about ourselves, but, you know, bringing, um, yeah, pleading, okay, for our neighbor, you know, maybe someone who's sick, maybe someone who's struggling, maybe someone who's lost a job, maybe someone who's dealing with health issues, um, or depression. I mean, there's just so many afflictions that we have, imprisonment, you know, exile, homelessness, abuse. I mean, it just goes on and on. And, and so realizing, okay, to bring those people, okay, before the throne of God, okay, we exercise our, our priesthood, not, we're not ministerial priesthood, but the baptismal priesthood. Baptism imprints on the soul an indelible spiritual sign, the character, which consecrates the baptized person for Christian worship. Because of the character, baptism cannot be repeated. Those who die for their faith, those who are catechumens, and all those who, without knowing of the church, but acting under the inspiration of grace, seek God sincerely and strive to fulfill his will, can be saved even if they have not been baptized. Again, that would be the baptism of blood and of desire. Since the earliest times, baptism has been administered to children, for it is a grace and a gift of God that does not presuppose any human merit. Okay? Again, because sometimes um, our separated brethren have difficulty with the fact that we baptize infants. But we know it's a grace of God. It's a gift of God. It's not something you earn, okay? Um, you know, it's not something we merit, okay? Our salvation is completely won by Christ, okay? We've been justified by him. Now, we have to cooperate with that justification, okay? Um, you, know, you know, we could be rebellious. We could say no. And our Lord, you know, he does say, you know, some people can work miracles, but he may have to say in eternity, I don't know you, okay? So there's actions that um, are also included with that belief. But um, as far as earning our baptism or earning a sacrament, no, we don't earn it. It's totally a gratuitous gift of God. And so we have belief that they actually even baptized as early as the time of the apostles. So they would do an entire household. So children are baptized in the faith of the church. Entry into Christian life gives access to true freedom. With respect to children who have died without baptism, the liturgy of the church invites us to trust in God's mercy and to pray for their salvation. And in case of necessity, any person can baptize provided that he have the intention of doing that which the church does and provided that he pours water on the candidate's head while saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right. Well, thank you for being here today. And let us pray to uh, the Blessed Trinity as our close. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.